بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولاه أما بعد So our Sheikh just finished uh, reciting Surah Al-Baqarah and as we know the ending of Surah Al-Baqarah is a very blessed portion of the Quran The Quran of course as it is is the most blessed of all speech Khairul Kalami Kalamullah The most blessed of all speech is the speech of Allah But within this speech of Allah certain portions are more blessed than others And so for example the greatest surah in the Quran is Surah Al-Fatiha and the greatest verse in the Quran is Ayat Al-Kursi and Surah Al-Ikhlas equals one-third of the Quran and so on and so forth so within the Quran certain phrases or certain ayat are more powerful than other even though the whole Quran taken as a whole is more powerful and more blessed than any other speech and therefore of those blessings and of those extra special verses are the last two verses of Surah Al-Baqarah and there are a number of traditions that are narrated about the blessings of these two verses. Of them is the hadith of Sahih Bukhari in which the Prophet wasallam said that whoever recites these two verses before he goes to sleep, kafatahu, they will be enough for him. They will be sufficient for him. What does it mean they will be sufficient for him? Scholars have differed. What does it exactly mean when the Prophet wasallam said it will be sufficient for him? And some scholars said that th this person, if he doesn't pray to Hajjud, inshallah, he'll get enough reward to get by because the average Sahabi would pray to Hajjud. And so the Prophet said, if he reads the last two verses, Alhamdulillah, kafata is just sufficient. Other scholars said, kafata who means they will protect him against shaitan. There's going to be a protection against him and between him and the shayateen. Other scholars said, it will be enough of a blessing for him to protect him from the fire of hell. And the interpretations go on, but the Prophet left it open. Whoever reads these two verses before he goes to sleep, it will be enough for him and therefore it is of the sunnah of the Prophet and it is of the sunnah of those who follow the sunnah of the Prophet that they recite these two verses every single night before they go to sleep. Of the blessings narrated about this are these two verses is also uh, the hadith reported in Sunan At-Tirmidhi, uh, sorry Sunan Al-Nisa'i in which the Prophet said that I have been given from underneath the, the, the kans, the, the treasure that is present under the throne of Allah, I have been given these two verses. The hadith says that there is a treasure under the throne of Allah. arsh. Of course, Allah has a throne and Allah has mentioned this throne in many verses in the Quran. Ar-Rahmanu ala al-Arsh istawa. There is an arsh and there is a kursi. Under this, this is of course ilm al-ghayb, we'll never understand what is all of this, but under this there is a treasure. And we know that the, the arsh and the kursi are the highest creation. There's nothing higher than that. The arsh and the kursi are the highest of the creation. Jannah itself is underneath the arsh. Jannah al firdaus the roof of it, is the arsh of Ar-Rahman. So under the arsh there is a treasure. There is a kanz. What is in that kanz? We have no idea. All that we know, one thing that we have from there, we have it on this earth. And this is what our Prophet ﷺ said. I have been given from underneath the treasure that is present under the throne of Ar-Rahman. I have been given the last two verses of Surat Al-Baqarah. In a, in a hadith in Musad Imam Ahmad, the Prophet ﷺ said, that when I went up to the journey of Al-Isra wal Mi'raj, Allah gave me three things. Allah gave me three things. Number one, He commanded me to pray five times a day. Number two, He gave me the last two verses of Surah Al-Baqarah. And number three, He promised me that anybody of my ummah who didn't do any major sins, he would be forgiven and go to Jannah. Anybody of my ummah who didn't do any major sins will be forgiven and go to Jannah. The minor sins will be forgiven if you avoid the major sins. So these are the three things that the Prophet was given directly when he went up in the journey of Al-Isra wa Al-Miraj. And from this, some scholars have said, and this is a theory, Allah knows if it's true or not. Some scholars have said that the entire Quran was revealed through Jibreel to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu except for the last two verses of Baqarah. From this hadith that I just mentioned, that when I went up to Isra wal Miraj, now, when he went up to Isra wal Miraj, what happened? Inshallah, when we get to the Sira lessons, we'll talk about it in more detail. But there's one phrase in it where the Prophet Sallallahu and Jibreel were going together, and then Jibreel says, I don't have permission to go beyond this, you have to proceed on your own. 
And that is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that فَكَانَ قَابَ قَوْسَيْنِ أَوْ أَدْنَى That the Prophet was closer than even two bows length or even closer than that. That the Prophet went to a place where even Jibreel was not allowed to go. He went higher than any created being. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke to him directly from behind the veil as he spoke to Musa on this earth from behind the veil. But our Prophet went up and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke to him there. Whereas for Musa, Allah spoke to him on Turi Sayna. Point being, no one was an intermediary between Allah and the Prophet when the prayer was legislated. And in the same hadith, the Prophet said, I was given the last two verses of Baqarah. So from this, many of the scholars of tafsir and the scholars of, of the sciences of the Quran, they have said that these two verses were given directly, i.e. Jibreel wasn't an intermediary, and that Allah recited these verses directly, and that the Prophet came down with them directly. And this would of course therefore mean that this has a very special blessing, that these were the only two verses that the Prophet was given directly without the intermediary of Jibreel. Now what is this tafsir of these verses? Very briefly now, لِلَّهِ مَا فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ This is of course, now a lot of people get confused. لِلَّهِ مَا فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ is not the beginning of the last two verses. These are the third, this is the third of the last three, right? آمَنَ الرَّسُولُ to the end are the actual last two verses. So don't get confused. آمَنَ الرَّسُولُ to the end of Baqarah, these are the last two verses. But لِلَّهِ مَا فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ is so much connected in meaning that every time when you read them in salah, you actually begin Again with Allah ma fi samawati ma fi al-ard. So Allah says, "Allah ma fi samawati ma fi al-ard." To Allah belongs all that is in the heavens and all that is on earth. Now, when Allah says, "To Allah belong," Allah, ownership here implies many things. Firstly, it implies creation, because. Ultimate ownership necessitates creation. What do I mean by this? You see, none of us are truly owners of anything. We simply transfer ownerships. We don't actually own. When you go buy your car, you didn't make your car. You simply transfer the ownership to yourself. When you go get a house, you didn't make, even if you made the house, what did you make it with? Material that you didn't create. So when Allah says, to Allah belongs everything, this means He doesn't owe a favor to anybody else. This means the creation is completely coming from Him and His speech and His qudra. He doesn't owe anybody anything. So Allah is the ultimate creator. When Allah says, to Allah belongs everything, this also means that He has the right to do as He pleases and no one can interfere. When Allah says, to Allah belongs everything, this means that Allah Allah is the king of kings and that whatever he decrees will take place and nobody can come between him and his decree. When Allah says to Allah belongs everything in the heavens and earth, this means that his knowledge encompasses everything. How can the owner not be aware of his own uh, object that he owns? You know where your ownership, you, you have it, you know it. When Allah owns everything, then his knowledge encompasses everything. As Allah says in the Quran, ala ya'lamu man khalaq. Doesn't the khaliq know? Ala ya'lamu man khalaq. Allah owns everything, He has to know everything as well. So Allah says everything in the heavens and earth. And we know that there are seven heavens, seven samawat. Allah has created seven samawat in tibaqa. Allah has created seven heavens in layers over each other. A lot of people get confused. Seven samawat are not the jannat. The heavens, meaning in English we call paradise, is different than the samawat. The samawat and the jannat are different. And the Jannat are occupied in the highest heaven. And we live in the lowest heaven, Sama Dunya. dunya Everything around us is the lowest of the seven. All that we see, the furthest star is in the lowest of these skies. Beyond this is a world we have no idea, and that's the sixth heaven. Beyond that is another world, the fifth. Beyond that is another fourth. Mankind's knowledge will never encompass even the lowest heaven. Forget the others. So don't get confused, Sabah Samawat are not Jannat. These are literally skies, heavens, one after the other. And then paradise will come to inshallah when we talk about in our seerah. That's something else which is in the highest of the heavens. So Allah says that all that is in the Samawat and the Ard belong to me. وَإِن تُبَدُوا مَا فِي أَنفُسِكُمْ أَوْ تُخْفُوهُ يُحَاسِبِكُمْ بِهِ اللَّهِ And if you declare and make open what is inside of you, or you keep it hidden, Allah will call you to account. Yuhasibikum bihillah. 
فَيَغْفِرُ لِمَنْ يَشَاءُ وَيُعَذِّبُ مَنْ يَشَاءُ And then after that, after he has done the muhasaba, muhasaba means to call to account. Muhasaba means to make a check. And that's why an accountant in Arabic is called muhasib. He's an accountant. He's taking check. So hisab means to know and to be aware of. Remember this, we're going to come to another verb which is different. Hisab means to know and to take account of. Allah is not ghafil. وَمَا رَبُّكَ بِغَافِلٍ عَمَّا يَعْبَلُونَ Allah is not unaware. Allah is aware. So even your thoughts, Allah is saying, I know them and I will call muhasaba of them. Then I will forgive whatever I want and I will punish whomever I want. وَاللَّهُ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٍ And Allah is capable of all things. Notice, Allah does not end the verse with وَاللَّهُ غَفُورٌ because it doesn't make sense here. Because Allah is saying, I'm going to punish and I'm going to forgive. So what characteristic combines punishment and forgiveness? Power. Wallahu ala kulli shay'in qadir. So Allah is saying, I am capable of doing anything. If I want to punish, I can punish. If I want to forgive, I can forgive. Now this verse came down before the last two. And the Prophet ﷺ recited it to the Sahaba. When the Sahaba heard this verse, Sahih Bukhari tells us, they must have had a meeting, we're reading it a little bit, they must have talked about this verse, and then they came back to the Prophet ﷺ, and they said, Ya Rasulullah, O Messenger of Allah, قَدْ كُلِّفْنَا مِنَ الْأَعْمَالِ مَا لَا نُطِقْ Now with this verse, Allah has told us to do something we cannot do. Allah told us to pray, we prayed. Allah told us to fast, we fasted. Allah told us to give zakah, we gave zakah. Allah told us for jihad, we gave jihad, we went for jihad. And now Allah is saying that even our thoughts are going to be called into account. We cannot do this, Ya Rasulullah. We can't do this. Our thoughts, what we think. We cannot do this, Ya Rasulullah. So the Prophet ﷺ said, do you wish to say like the people of Musa said to Musa that we cannot do this? That we reject the commandment of Allah? Do not say this. No, this is not the attitude of the believer. Rather say, سَمِعْنَا وَأَطَعْنَا غُفْرَانَكَ رَبَّنَا وَإِلَيْكَ الْمَصِيرِ Notice the last two verses have not come down yet. The last two verses have not come down. And the Prophet is telling them, your attitude is wrong. You've just heard Allah say something and then you're saying, I cannot do it. This is wrong. Rather, your attitude should be that سَمِعْنَا وَأَطَعْنَا We hear and we obey. غُفْرَانَكَ رَبَّنَا We ask your maghfirah, O Allah. غُفْرَانَكَ رَبَّنَا وَإِلَيْكَ الْمَصِيرِ And to you we return. After the Prophet ﷺ said this, then Allah revealed these two verses, literally quoting the Prophet ﷺ's statement and then making it a part of the Qur'an. So initially this phrase was not a part of the Qur'an. But this comes from the iman of the Prophet ﷺ, that this is the attitude of the believer. And that which came from him actually came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then reaffirmed that spirit and reaffirmed that attitude. And the next two verses were revealed. And these are the two verses that are the blessed verses. Amen al-Rasul. The Prophet himself believes. Bima unzil ilayhim rabbi. The attitude, look. The Prophet did not know how to explain these verses. He said, look, don't have this attitude. He didn't offer, no, the actual meaning is this. No, he said, this is not the right level of Iman. So when he demonstrated what is real Iman, Allah praised him. The Prophet ﷺ has believed in whatever Allah has revealed. This is the reality of Iman. We hear and we obey. Right? آمَنَ الرَّسُولُ بِمَا أُنزِلِ لَيْهِ مِرَبِّهِ وَالْمُؤْمِنُونَ And the real believers, this will also be their attitude. That they will have iman. كُلٌ All of them, the Prophet and the believers, آمَنَ بِاللَّهِ That they believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَمَلَائِكَةِ وَكُتُبِ الرُّسْلِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ They believe in these five pillars. Right? كُلٌ آمَنَ بِاللَّهِ وَمَلَائِكَةِ وَكُتُبِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ um, uh, of course, the reason why Surah Al-Baqarah is finishing with this is because the whole Surah talks about Musa and talks about Isa and talks about Ibrahim alayhi salam. There's many different prophets mentioned. And so at the end, remember when was Baqarah revealed? Talking to the Jews, talking to the people of the book. So at the end, Allah is saying, لا نفرق بين أحد من رسله That the attitude of the believer is, we don't make tafriq between the messengers. What is tafriq? Tafriq means we believe in some and reject others. Notice the verb here is farq and not fadl. Because there is fadl. Allah says in the Quran, تِلْكَ الرُّسُلُ فَضَّلْنَا بَعْضَهُمْ عَلَى بَعْضٍ 
There is tafdeel between the prophets. There is no tafriq between the prophets. I repeat, this is a fundamental principle of Sunni Islam, Ahl Sunnah wa Jama'ah. There is tafdeel, fadl, between the prophets. Our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi is the best Prophet and he has the Fadl and the Ulul Azm, Ibrahim and Musa and Isa and uh, the Prophet Nuh Alayhi and our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi these are the Ulul Azm, they have the highest rank and the other Prophets are not to their level. So, Tilka Rusulu Fadlna Ba'adahum Ala Ba'ad. There is Tafdeel but there is no Tafriq. La Nufarriqu Bayna Ahadim Rusulin. Farq means we'll accept some, reject others, we don't do that. La Nufarriqu, they're all Prophets of Allah. La Nufarriqu Bayna Ahadim Rusulin. That Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is saying that all Prophets are the same when it comes to the message that they are preaching. لا نفرق بين عمل رسوله وقالوا سمعنا وأطعنا and this is the attitude that the Prophet ﷺ said وقالوا they say سمعنا وأطعنا we hear and we obey notice our religion is based upon two pillars and I mentioned them in the previous khutbas I've given what are the two pillars علم and عمل علم and عمل knowledge and action as for the علم سمعنا as for the عمل أطعنا let me translate that for the, those who don't understand the Arabic phrases. Our religion is based upon two pillars, knowledge and action. And these two pillars are fundamental for the believer. And you cannot have Islam without both of these pillars. You have to know the truth and then act upon it. And so this is what the last two verses of Baqarah say. وَقَالُوا سَمِعْنَا وَأَطَعْنَا We hear with our the ilm. وَأَطَعْنَا We obey with our bodies and our actions. غُفْرَانَكَ رَبَّنَا وَإِلَيْكَ الْمَصِيرِ غُفْرَانَكَ is in Arabic called it the masdar, which is the verbal noun. And ghufranak in some ways is more powerful than saying ighfir lana. Because ghufranak means your forgiveness, O Allah. And it doesn't mean forgive me, O Allah. Ighfir means forgive me. Ghufranak means your forgiveness. It is as if we are invoking, O Allah, we want your forgiveness. And therefore, Trying to make this uh, without going too complicated, it's, it's tangible. Your forgiveness is something that is close by. Your forgiveness is something we want. And this is more powerful than saying, forgive us, O oh Allah. It is as if you are invoking the forgiveness. It's right there. I want it. It's like right there. You want it. And we will return to you. And as we said, the Prophet said this phrase and Allah confirmed it and affirmed it and it became from a hadith, it became upgraded to the Qur'an. If from a hadith it became upgraded to the Qur'an and the Prophet attitude was then embodied in the Qur'an itself. And Allah then says to confirm that what the Prophet said is correct. لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها. Allah will not put more on you than you can bear. Don't worry, I know what I said. لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها. No soul will be burdened with more than it can bear. Now notice here, the first verse says that يحاسبكم به الله. And notice محاسبة. What did I say? It means it means Allah takes account of it. Was this verse abrogated? No. Allah will still take account of it. Allah knows your thoughts. Allah knows what you think. Then Allah says, فَيَغْفِرُ لِمَنْ يَشَاءُ Allah will forgive whomever He wants. And the verse later on clarifies, and the hadith clarifies, anything that is in your soul of a thought will be forgiven. If you think of something bad and you don't act upon it, Allah will forgive it. فَيَغْفِرُ لِمَنْ يَشَاءُ So the verse has not been abrogated. The Sahaba misunderstood it. And in their attitude, in their attitude, they were saying, we cannot do this. The Prophet said, this is not the right attitude. So the Bottom line, the verse is as it is. Because muhasaba doesn't mean punishment. Muhasaba means to take into account. Muhasaba means Allah knows about it. Just because Allah knows about it doesn't mean you're going to be punished. If it was in your mind, so you passed by something, very fancy car, or you had an opportunity to steal money, and you thought, if only I could get that through haram. Or you saw some evil in the street, and you, saw, you, you felt something bad in your heart. That thought will be forgiven. That thought will be forgiven. If you acted upon it, then of course you will get the sin. So, لَهَا مَا كَسَبَتُ عَلَيْهَا مَا كَسَبَتْ That uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَهَا مَا كَسَبَتْ For لَا يُكَلِّفُ اللَّهُ نَفْسًا إِلَّا وُسْعَهَا Every soul will bear what it can, nothing more than that. لَهَا مَا كَسَبَتْ For every soul, لَهَا for its advantage, will be that which it has earned. وَعَلَيْهَا And against it, مَكْتَسَبَتْ Will be that which it 
has earned. So laha wa alayha. Kasaba iktasaba. There is a duality here. Laha alayha. Laha means for you. Alayha means against you. And therefore Allah is saying, I am not going to punish you for something that I have done, but rather for something you have done. I am not going to put you in circumstances that are of not of your doing. You have done this yourself. Laha ma kasabat wa alayha ma ktasabat. For you will be all that you earn. Kasaba means to earn. Wa alayha ma ktasaba. And against you will be that which you have earned. Now, kasaba and iktasaba are not the same structure. Kasaba and iktasaba are not the same. Anybody who reads the two, you see the difference. Kasaba ala wazni fa'ala. Iktasaba ala wazni ifta'ala. Iktasaba has an added effort because there's an extra letter there. Iktasaba has an added effort. Kasaba has no such effort. Basically, what Allah is saying, laha ma kasabat. For you will be the good which is easy to earn. Kasaba is easy. But to do sin, you have to struggle to do sin. Iktasaba. You have to fight to do sin. Getting sin is more difficult than getting good. Laha ma kasab. Kasab is easy. Iktasab is difficult. Wa alayha ma ktasabat. And therefore what Allah is saying basically, the basic nature of human beings is to want to do good. And the paths for good are easy. And the paths for good are many. Laha ma kasabat. Wa alayha ma ktasabat. But against it will be that which it strove to obtain. You had to fight to get it. Iktasaba, there was an extra effort. So to do sin is not easy. To do good is easy. And there are more paths to good than there are paths to sin. لَهَا مَا كَسَبَتْ وَعَلَيْهَا مَا اكْتَسَبَتْ رَبَّنَا لَا تُؤَاخِذْنَا Now here once again, as we said, every time there is a Quranic dua, our iman should boost up to the skies because Allah is telling us how to make dua. Allah is telling us what should you say to me in order to get your 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 uh, uh, your goal. What is the proper method for filling out the petition for the forms? Allah is telling you, and therefore the Quranic duas are the most powerful duas. Rabbana la tuakhidna. Here is the verb I wanted to contract with. A contrast with yuhasibikum. Mu'akhada and muhasaba, two separate things. Mu'akhada means punishment. Akhda azizim muqtadir. Akhda aziz means the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So here Allah is saying, Rabbana la tu'akhidna. Oh Allah, don't punish us. And the first verb was yuhasibikum. Allah will make hisab. And this is the contrast. Allah is not going to punish you for your thoughts, even though hisab will be made of your thoughts. Hisab here means Allah knows them. You're not going to get any punishment for them. So Rabbana la tu'akhidna. Oh our Lord, do not punish us. In nasina aw akhta'na. There's two ways of committing a fault. You do it unintentionally, you do it intentionally. Unintentionally nasina. We forgot. So Nasina here, you, you forgot it was time to pray, you didn't pray. This is Nisyan, you forgot it. And Akhta'na, you made a mistake. And you knew it was a mistake. So we ask Allah for both intentional and unintentional. Rabbana la tu'akhidna in Nasina aw Akhta'na. Rabbana wa la tahmil alayna isran kama hamaltahu ala ladhina min qablina. And O oh our Lord, wa la, we add a wow, we're asking many things, O oh Allah. Wa la tahmil alayna, don't put on us. Isra. What does is Isr mean? Isr means a very strict treaty. A very strict, if you like, even law is how the scholars interpreted. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that when our Prophet Muhammad came, وَيَضَعُ عَنْهُمْ إِسْرَهُمْ وَالْأَغْلَالَ الَّتِي كَانَتْ عَلَيْهِمْ That the Prophet came to remove their Isr. What is Isr? Scholars said this is the strict laws that were placed upon the previous generations or the previous nations. And if you compare our Sharia to the Sharia of the other previous generations, even look at today's Orthodox Jews and how they follow their Sharia. It's such a difficult Sharia and it's such a complicated Sharia. You cannot even eat milk and meat on the same table. All of these laws over and over again. So we ask Allah, Rabbana wala tahmil alayna isra. Don't make our lives difficult with that burden. Kama hamaltahu ala min qablina. 
the previous shari'ahs had that. And our shari'ah is the easiest shari'ah. يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ بِكُمُ الْيُسْرَ وَلَا يُرِيدُ بِكُمُ الْعُسْرَ Notice even when we talked about the different types of fast, how did the Christians and Jews used to fast? Around 22 hours, not just 14 hours. They would fast from one isha to the next maghrib. They only had two hours to eat, three hours to eat. And Allah made it easier for us. So, وَلَا تَحْمِلْ عَلِينَا إِسْرًا كَمَا حَمَلْتَهُ عَلَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِنَا رَبَّنَا وَلَا تُحَمِّلْنَا O oh, our Lord, do not place upon us مَا لَا طَاقَةَ لَنَا بِهِ That which we don't have the power to bear. And Allah Azza wa Jal, the Prophet says that every time you make this dua, Allah says, قَدْ فَعَلْتُ I have done so and I will do so. رَبَّنَا وَلَا تُحَمِّلْنَا مَا لَا طَاقَةَ لَنَا بِهِ وَاعْفُ عَنَّا وَاغْفِرْ لَنَا وَارْحَمْنَا Three specific verbs. وَاعْفُ عَنَّا وَاغْفِرْ لَنَا وَارْحَمْنَا We ask Allah's mu'afa for our sins. وَاغْفِرْ لَنَا We ask Allah's maghfira for our shortcomings in our fard deeds. وَارْحَمْنَا We ask Allah's rahmah for whatever is left of this life and in death in the qabr. So, وَاعْفُ عَنَّا for our sins. We shouldn't have done things, we ask Allah's afu. وَاغْفِرْ لَنَا For falling short in our good duties. We didn't pray as we're supposed to. We didn't fast as we're supposed to. We didn't read the Quran as we're supposed to. وَاغْفِرْ لَنَا وَارْحَمْنَا For all that is left in our lives. Other scholars have said, وَاعْفُ عَنَّا What is between us and you, O oh Allah, our private sins. وَاغْفِرْ لَنَا Our sins between us and other people of humanity. وَارْحَمْنَا For the remainder of our lives. And so all of these are correct interpretations and we ask Allah for His Afu and His Mawfira and His Rahma. أَلْتَ مَوْلَانَا You are our Mawla. Mawla means the one who is closest to us. Because the actual meaning of Wali is the one who is close to you. And Allah says, Allahu waliyyu alladheena amanu. That Allah is the wali of the true believers. So the mawla is the one who is the closest to you. And the meaning of closeness here is love and protection and taking care of. Anta mawlana, you are our master who loves us. You are our owner who will protect us. This is the mawla. And that is why the freed slave calls his master mawlaya. Because his master protects him. His master owns him. His master nourishes him. His master is in control. His master is going to protect him. So the freed slave calls his master mawlaya. And so anta mawlana, you are the ultimate mawla of Allah. And in the famous incident in the battle of Uh that when Abu Sufyan and the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu and the Sahaba were having a shouting match at the end of the battle of Uhud, when, the, when Abu Sufyan wanted to go away proud, the last thing he said, لَنَا الْعُزَّى وَلَا عُزَّى لَكُمْ We have the famous idol of Uzza, you have no Uzza. So the Prophet Sallallahu said, respond to him, don't let this threat go idle. Umar ibn Khattab said, what should we say, Ya Rasulullah? So the Prophet Sallallahu said, قولوا, say to him, Allahu Mawlana wala Mawla lakum. Allah is our Mawla, you have no Mawla. Allah is our Mawla, you have no Mawla. So because Allah is our Mawla, what this means is that Allah will take care of us. Is that Allah will provide for us. Is that Allah will protect us. Because that is what a wali does. Anta Mawlana, O Allah, fansurna ala al-qawm al-kafirin. Those people who have not taken you as a Mawla, they don't have your wilaya. We need your help, O Allah, against all of those enemies. Anta Mawlana, fansurna ala al-qawm al-kafirin. This is a short tafsir of these last verses of Surah Al-Baqarah. And let us make it a habit, insha'Allah ta'ala, to recite it regularly and frequently and especially to recite it every single night before going to sleep as was the sunnah of our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa akhru da'wana alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa sallallahu wa sallam wa alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in